for, uh, seems like a good turnout. Um, so my name's Eric, and I'm here today to talk about how Microsoft is using the Wikipedia maps paired with spatial audio to improve independent mobility for blind users. So with the emergence of mobile devices and GPS sensors going into those devices, whether it's IoT devices or phones, the, um, the, the need to have more elastic and available and open geospatial data is more imperative now than ever. So a little about me. I'm a senior engineer at Microsoft that works out of the New York City location. And first and foremost, I have one of the coolest jobs on the planet. I get to work with Microsoft's most strategic partners and get to work on the toughest technical challenges and problems and all the solutions that our team engineers are general purpose and open source. So other Microsoft partners and other developers and other um, partners that we have can take those solutions and apply it to their own scenario. Uh, our partners can range from small startups to large institutions and to philanthropy organizations like Do Guide Dogs and the United Nations. Uh, we're huge open source enthusiasts on, among our team. Um, we, about 95, 99% of the projects we work on is, is eventually open sourced. Uh, we're big proponents of uh, open data solutions. Uh, I am, my current role uh, in this project was the back-end architect and engineer for the Cities Unlocked project that I'll be talking about shortly. And prior to this project, I was one of the early contributors to React Native uh, for Windows, uh, which we announced at Facebook's FA conference about six months ago. So about two years ago, uh, we partnered with the Guide Dogs Association to take on the ambitious aspiration of building a navigation system for blind people. With Cities Unlocked, we're, we're revolutionizing mobile navigation with being able to call out and spatially render and synthesize uh, nearby places, points of interest, and places and landmarks. We started to think deeply about how we can empower people to be more independent, uh, be more mobile, and act almost very similar to the way that sighted people would in terms of when they go out in journeys. We wanted blind people to feel more confident and minimize the fear of going out and to be able to individually go on and, and go on through a journey. So it's been quite a journey. And what did we build? We built a, mo we built a mobile navigation app that the inter user interface is fully audio based. So what this is, is it's an iOS app that runs in background mode and it sits in the user's pocket or a bag and it's paired with a custom-made headset that our team built. And on the back of this custom-made headset, we have head tracking sensors so that it tracks where a person is looking, where they currently are, and how fast they're moving. In this headset, there's a GPS sensor, there's a, um, a gyrometer, there's a accelerometer, and, um, and a compass. So the, the headset is near ear audio. So the, the, the earpiece that's near the ear, it doesn't block the ear because you can't block the ear for blind people because it's such a vital sound. They need to be able to hear ambient, ambient noise. And the headpiece is paired with a custom remote. So there's a mic on the headpiece and there's a button that basically triggers on this remote here, this button right here, that says to listen, to actually listen to voice commands. And as a person changes the location or approaches new objects, new places or landmarks, the application will automatically call out that, that place, that landmark, and it'll call it out spatially relative to where the person's directly looking. So for example, if Central Park was here on my right and I was saying right here, it would call out to me saying that Central Park is 10 meters away, but the sound would come from my right ear and emanate from my right. As I, turned, as I turned facing Central Park, immediately thereafter, it would then call out that same phrase, depending on how far I, wa I was, as if it's standing right in front of me. So just to see how everything works, I'm going to demonstrate the app.
So here I just set my location to right in front of Central Park. Heading north on Central Park South. So About actually, five meters south from the Central Park South intersection. So the voice is all configurable. The dialect is configurable. User has the option of choosing whatever dialect they want. Um, what I just called out, the command I just invoked was where am I? So it tells me the street that I am, the address that I'm at, uh, how far away I am from the nearest intersection. Now I'm going to invoke a command called what's around, what's ahead of me. So what's directly in front of me? Central Park, close by, crossing. No description available. Central Park. So now I have Central the Park to is say an urban park in Middle Upper Manhattan within New York City. Central Park is the most visited urban park in the United States with 40 million visitors in 2013. Crossing within 30 meters, USS Main Monument around 75 meters, Trump International. Hush, it, hush. So, <laughs> it's a lot of information, you can tell. But um, so with any object that's called out, the user has the ability to ask for more information. And what we do is, for that particular object, if there is a linkage between that object and OpenStreetMap and Wikipedia, um, we pull in the first three sentences from the Wikipedia summary of that object. So people have context into uh, what's actually in front of them. Warning, GPS accuracy is poor, navigation is restricted, use information with caution. So we're very, so if the user is in front of, if the user has poor GPS accuracy, we will call that out. GPS accuracy is good. So now I'm going to do a turn-by-turn -turn navigation request. Take you to a cafe. And you're off. Don't forget that take warning. me to is a work in progress. You are responsible for your safety. Always use your best judgment and mobility skills. Walking to Coffee Cake Corner on 6th Avenue. So you're going to hear ETA a click is about sound 35 minutes. To basically, to Walk basically west on Central Park area. South forward slash West 59th Street. In about 30 meters. Turn. So. So the click clack sound that you just heard was basically when we go to get a turn by turn navigation instruction, when a person asks to take me to a particular place, we actually create a track from that, current, that person's current position to the endpoint. And if that person veers off track, then the, that click-clack sound will get stronger to basically guide the person back on track. So it's almost like, think of it like uh, following the light of a, of a lighthouse, the beacon of a lighthouse, and trying to get to that final point. The, the app that we built here is very similar to, you could think of an analogy of if you're in a museum and you have a headpiece on to basically tell you the information about the painting as you approach that painting. We're trying to basically paint the world uh, for the user, trying to basically paint it with sound, render it with sound, give OpenStreetMap um, objects and nodes uh, a voice. So when a user first gets the box, uh, the custom uh, hardware and the remote, this is what they see. Um, this is not the actual uh, headset. The headset is still uh, in the Microsoft garage. We're still um, working on um, some, some dev changes. But as soon as you open the box, it'll, it'll actually call out uh, what the instructions are in terms of how to actually set up, set up the device. Um, with the remote control, the remote control has commands that are binded to it. So there's commands here that, that you could actually invoke a more information command or a where am I command. Um, with the D-pad, uh, control here, you could actually click through and uh, it'll actually tell you what's directly in front of you by clicking up, what's on your left, what's on your right, and what's directly behind you. You could actually repeat a command. There's a repeat button. There's also a hush button, as you could imagine, would, would come in handy. And as I said earlier, the, um, the listen uh, button as well. So most of you already know about OpenStreetMap, but um, just to kind of just go through the the, the background of OSM came out in 2004 at a time when mapping data was um, only controlled by large institutions and government agencies. Uh, access to that data was very restricted, is very expensive. Um, Steve Coast came up and um, created the first open, you know, open sourced uh, map of the UK. Um, and the, Steve actually used to work at Microsoft. He actually used to work at Bing uh, for three years. And 
to create the initial data set of OpenStreetMap, it was created off of deciphering uh, Bing aerial imageries, as well as uh, Census Bureau data off the Tiger data set. Uh, OpenStreetMap works very similar to Wikipedia. Um, the data is collect, GPS coordinates are tracked, are collected by uh, the users, and um, the data is then, the resulting data is uploaded to Wikipedia. I'm sorry, to OpenStreetMap. It's free, editable, and it's crowdsourced, um, very flexible database license with the open database license, and um, no approval, no uh, data approval body. So just to briefly talk about the services that are, that are powering this. Um, so we're using, making heavy use of the Cortana um, voice recognition services for text-to-speech, speech-to-text, um, as well as the conversation as a service. So being able to create uh, data um, machine learning models on uh, trying to decipher phrases that a person says. So if a person were to say, take me to a coffee house, that we were to decipher that as taking to a cafe. So you could actually create um, phrases to basically have more accurate um, deciphering of, of the commands. Uh, Cortana is one of the, at the forefront in terms of having accurate uh, voice recognition services. Um, the automatic callouts for being able to actually have the nearby points of interest in places. Um, we make heavy use off MapSend's uh, vector tile service for that. Uh, the routing engine, the turn-by-turn -turn navigation, um, make heavy use of um, MapSend's turn-by-turn uh, -turn routing services as they have an open source Valhalla routing engine for that. Um, you know, forward and reverse geocoding. Uh, local search, so this is, we able to support arbitrary searches, so being able to say, take me to a French restaurant, or take me to 12 Perry Street, or uh, take me to Starbucks, which will basically default to the nearest Starbucks, um, or you can say, take me to Starbucks near Broadway, and it will basically know to go to actually Broadway. Uh, more information, as I mentioned, from Wikipedia, and the look ahead feature, which is able to call out nearby uh, in what landmarks and uh, intersections are directly in front of you. Uh, you make, as I mentioned, make heavy use of, of MapSend's uh, source, uh, third party um, services, Cortana, uh, OpenStreetMap, Wikipedia, and also OpenCage um, Geocoder. Um, one of the big, most appealing part of OpenStreetMap for us was the accessibility features. The ability to actually uh, track the walkways and paths and alleys and being able to say that how many, stair, how many steps are at a stairwell to avoid users from going uh, to those stairwells. How lit a, a sidewalk is to basically guide users to having um, you know, more of a, a safe route. So just to talk about what's, what's under the hood. So we thought we built, so the way that we implemented this was a tile-based navigation platform. Um, so we basically pinpoint what tile a uh, user currently is in. So anyone that's not familiar, so with the tile base, the world is divided up in tiles. The top level tile is one single tile. As you go one level deep, um, that one parent tile is divided up into four tiles. So it's based on a row column and a zoom level. Um, you know, the deepest zoom level is 19 with 275 trillion tiles total in the world. So we figure out where a person, what tile a person's at, uh, figure out all the nearby tiles, and then we use MapSense vector tile uh, service to take that tile and create structured data off of that and get the structured data off of that. So our services then take that data um, and, we ca and we index it, and we index it in Elasticsearch. Um, now, when we look at the nearby tiles and we see that those, any of those nearby tiles are not in our index, we'll basically, grab, we'll basically make a call out to MapSend, get the data, and cache it. And we have a whole like Ford node uh, cl elastic cluster to ensure that we have a near real-time search. Um, we have a nightly um, Azure web job that basically ensures that the data in our, in our elastic index is uh, up to date with OpenStreetMap. Um, we, as I mentioned, we integrate with Wikipedia. And the idea is that we want to take this whole entire platform and we're going to open source it and make it available on GitHub um, and offer it as a platform as a service so anyone can take it and um, being able to actually just get started um, with, with uh, querying uh, OpenStreetMap data in an efficient way. So with the fact that uh, as a user changes their heading direction, the data that comes back has to be very fast. 
It has to be, you know, very, very quick. Um, we, our users, our, our sponsors basically told us that it has to be almost like one tenth, one -tenth of a second. Uh, so we use the Elasticsearch um, engine, which is based off of Lucene, the Lucene Apache project. And it's a search server. And that's, it's, it's a technology that's written in Java and it's open source. And what it's able to do is partition the data in, um, in shards. So you're able to have like five different shards. A shard is a partition. So you're able to divide up computing, parallelize computing within a given across many shards. And then you could grow this out um, horizontally and scale the platform horizontally as the data grows. Um, it's just a matter of just putting a new node on the cluster network and then just uh, configuring your discovery um, network about being aware of what that node is. Uh, the great thing about Elasticsearch is fault tolerant. It's load balance. Um, we rely on a heavy for our local search querying, so being able to do fuzzy matching searches to be able to accommodate for misspelled words, um, because when you're using text-to-speech, it's not always going to be 100% accurate. Um, it's fully powered by Azure. So the turn-by-turn -turn navigation, the great thing that we're, we're doing with turn-by-turn -turn navigation, it's all pedestrian-based routes. Um, so with the way that MapSend's um, routing comes back is that it'll first default to a uh, walkway, a pedestrian walkway, if it's there uh, according to your requested route. If it's not there, it'll then go to the road route. So, and it's able to avoid steps and alleyways, and it's, it's tailored for leveraging accessibility data that you, that you map in, in OpenStreetMap. So just to talk about the spatial audio, um, so one of, the, one of the most important things to, for visually impaired people is that they, they use sound to position orientate themselves. Microsoft Research created a sound engine that simulates sound in a three-dimensional globe through space by controlling the frequency of the sound uh, to create the perception of distance variations. Uh, so the way it works is that it basically, you, with, the things that, with the objects you want to render, you basically provide the actual space, the, the distance, and the direction that that object is relative to you. And they basically, HRTF is the name of the engine, and it stands for Head Related Transfer Function. And it's basically, it's controlling the frequency of how, how far, what the frequency is between the sound traveling to your left ear and your right ear. I don't have time to actually demo this, um, but how are we monitoring all this? There's a lot going on here. There's a lot of services, a lot of dependencies. How do we ensure that these services are all operating well? So we're using application insights to track our telemetry, to get insight on in our telemetry. So we're tracking things like uh, the GPS accuracy on the device, um, what the network latency is, the battery levels, um, how long did a route take? How much did a, did a person veer off course of the route? How many people actually completed the route? So application insight is a great way to gain transparency and insight into what the state of your app is, who's using it, what cities you're using it in. And we also have, you're able to set up web tests to actually um, be alerted, to, be, to get alerted in the event that a certain service, a certain dependency is exceeding uh, a threshold. So you're able to benchmark your services. So we do call out a lot to, in order to manage that. Um, all the amenities, we basically map amenity types in OpenStreetMap to super categories. And users are able to configure which, which super categories they actually want to automatically hear and not hear. So a super category being location sense. So I changed my location, the app telling you. Um, mobility, uh, mobility specific amenities. Um, So why, why OpenStreetMap as opposed to other map providers? The update schedule is great. Um, we're able to get act the data is able to get propagated down to the, um, make the data available within 20 minutes of a change in OpenStreetMap. Um, the data is very, it's, it's very flexible in terms of the taxonomy and the data schema. Um, and the accessibility story, being able to actually track accessibility related information of our spatial data and having our services tail tailor and cater to that. Uh, flexible license, the thriving community, and uh, being able to support offline navigation, um, 
the growing community. So big challenge. Um, we are heavily reliant on pedestrian routes, um, pedestrian paths, sidewalks. So um, you know there, that that the availability of that is very sparse in OpenStreetMap. So um, that was one big challenge. GPS accuracy is a challenge. GPS is not perfect. Uh, so if your GPS is, is inaccurate, then the quality of the results are going to be inaccurate with it. Okay. I know I skimmed through that, sorry. Um, it's a lot to pack in for a short talk, so I'm gonna open it for questions. Is there a phone currently out on the market that provides a high enough level of GPS accuracy that it would make that like, work in a more secure use building? So the question is, is that are there, are there phones out there that do help alleviate some of the GPS accuracy issues? Um, the only, I mean, the GPS devices, the tracking devices, are the ones that have the highest level of accuracy. Um, Google, I, I think you have, to, you have to be able to build the algorithms of being able to smooth out the accuracy issues and being able to see exactly how much, what's at one point that it is able to basically um, figure that you are at most, in terms of as it does move around, like you could vary it and smooth it out. Um, we are working on in integrating those algorithms um, to the platform. But a particular device, no, I, I haven't seen anything out there than regular phone, and it's very limited. So the, the question, I, there's a couple of parts to that question. I guess the one question is, how do we test this? Um, and how do we validate the user experience? So we're in user trials right now. The, the design actually came, the user experience design came from blind people. Came from our trial users were, were blind users. Um, we've been doing research, pro, we've been actually did, did this whole thorough con, um, research study with, with, with blind users, actually with guide dogs. Um, so th that, that's been ongoing for a year. Um, they're in the midst of testing this right now and validating the software. Um, with the 3D audio, it's able to, with the sound, because blind people have such an innate, detailed perception of sound, with it coming and with, with the ability for it to emanate in different directions, it provides more of a clarity picture of where that object is. Um, without that, it would be very difficult to create a user experience that, that, this, that would work with, with the target audience because they have to have some sense of direction of where that sound is, where these objects are. Yeah. Um, so the question is, is how would you use this for m transportation modes outside of just pedestrian walking for buses? Um, so right now we just support the pedestrian walkway um, uh, scenario. Uh, buses is challenging because you'd have to tell the user when a bus is literally arriving. And we tried that before with beacons. and. It was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> it was a disaster because um, in order to have blind users hear that things are happening as they happen, it has to be real time. Literally, it has to ha like there can't be any delay. So um, buses just were really hard. Um, if you have something like Transitland that does have minute by minute update, then that is something we would we would seriously love to to engage in and and explore. So. Um, 
we haven't. We haven't. We've had our hands full with just doing the pedestrian walkway. Um, it is, but transit is next phase. Uh, it is on the roadmap, and this is not just limited to blind people. I mean, the long-term goal is to open this up for sighted people as well. Not really. So, um, well, it is, but it's, it's on their plan. So one of the things is there is another project in Microsoft that, is a, that does have a camera on a pair of sunglasses, and it's able to use um, our cognitive service, our image recognition software, to decipher those objects and be able to create structured data on what that object is. Um, the idea is to pair that and eventually merge that in. Yeah, eventually, yeah, but not in the media plan. Right. Uh, there's another question in the back, I believe. Uh, so the question is that, do we plan on having any interactive features to report um, invalid data that they've encountered or users encountered. We do have a mechanism in the app that you can basically rate the quality of the data coming back, but we don't expose that to, it's more for our user experience team and our testers, um, but not for our users, just because um, we, we just worry that it might be a little bit too challenging to, for blind users to use. But we do have the feature for regular sighted users. I mean, yes, uh, so the, the question was um, supporting partially, partially visually impaired people. I'm sorry? Low vision. vision. Being able to support users with low vision. Um, yes, it's, it's definitely, we have, we have spoken about that. Um, the features can be extended to support that um, with the fact that we do have our cognitive services and our, our voice recognition um, capabilities as well as spatial audio. So it's a matter of just um, you know, tailoring the user experience to support that. Yes? Uh, so I know your demonstration sort of shows uh, references to some of the plan applications. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of your end users, people and end users, will actually understand that process and able to uh, kind of apply that to them? So in order to know me, to be such a visual representation on a map of I'm blind for from birth, I don't know what it is. Right. Yeah, I mean, we say, so the question was, is that, so no, compass direction um, and relevance to um, our target audience, blind users, how, how can they decipher that? Um, so we, we say that just to establish context. Um, some users kind of do figure, they do know the, you know, they, they, can, they can figure it out, but that's where the spatial audio piece comes in. Um, being able to have the audio come in the direction that it's at and the click clack sound to guide them along um, they, they rely on that quite heavily. Um, the direction of where things are, we're just, we're just using that in terms of real detailed context of where things are located, relevant to where the user is located. So for example, if an intersection's right there, or if an intersection's on my right, being able to say an intersection is, is on your right or towards, towards you know, 10 meters east of, of your current location. Do you have time for more questions? Or? Any more questions? No. Uh, it's um, a website where like people can like um, just like click on features and like say whether or not like it supports the wheelchair and disability. Oh yes, yes, yes. I do remember seeing this. Yes, yes. I was wondering if you had considered like making a website like that like, for like uh, deaf people. I'm not deaf people. Sorry, like, like people. 
So, um, in term, so the question is that uh, creating a, you know, have we considered creating a website to improve the, the quality of the data in OpenStreetMap? So next week, we have a hack fest with some of the guys on the team where we're using aerial imagery uh, and street view imagery and machine learning of deciphering those images to try to detect where walking paths are in the world. Um, the goal would be to take those deciphered walking paths and contribute it back to OpenStreetMap so that the turn-by-turn -turn navigation can factor those in and we have more accurate routes. Okay, well thanks everyone for your time.